Thank you for joining us this morning. So this morning, I have the pleasure of inviting a broad array of perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences to help us tackle and cover some of those questions. So please, uh, as I introduce them, please give them a warm round of applause. Uh, and I'd like to start with Sheha Hanadi Al Fani. She is the chairperson of Injaz Al Harab. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> And next up, I'd like to invite Maya Chita Tegmark. She is a postdoctoral research fellow at Tufts University and a co founder of the Future of Life Institute. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Rose Luckin. She is a professor of learner centered design at the University College of London, and her research is in artificial intelligence and education. Welcome to the stage. All right, well, thank you for joining us this, uh, this morning. Um, to start off with, I'd like to just learn a little bit more about your various organizations. I just did a very brief introduction right there, but um, let's start with you, Sheha Hanadi. Um, tell us a little bit more about Injaz Al Harab and um, some of the work that you do that's related to our conversation that we're going to have about skills for the future. Um, Injaz Al Harab is a part of the Junior Achievement Worldwide. Uh, we are the um, Middle Eastern arm of Junior Achievement. So we work in 13 countries and uh, our aim is to promote financial literacy, uh, success skills and entrepreneurship in the youth of uh, these countries. Mm -hmm. Up to date we've uh, reached around for, uh, 5 million uh, students worldwide, uh, youth from the Arab world. Mm -hmm. We work in 13 countries uh, as I said and um, uh, we have bases in every country. So in just Qatar, in just Bahrain, in just Saudi, mm -hmm. we have bases in every country. And uh, that's, that's okay. basically my passion. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, Maya, tell us a little bit, we got a, a little bit of a teaser uh, from Max just now, a little bit about the work, the Future of Life Institute, but tell us a little bit more maybe directly about the, the work that you do there. Yeah. Um, so in addition to the hat that I wear uh, being a co-founder of the Future of Life Institute, um, I'm also a postdoc in a human-robot interaction lab. I'm the only psychologist, the only person uh, coming from the social sciences in a world of robotics and trying to infuse a little bit uh, more knowledge about human-human uh, human development. Uh, with the Future of Life Institute, uh, Max and I started this organization, this nonprofit organization that's very focused on the beneficial uses of technology, with this idea in mind that technology is giving us the power to flourish like never before, but also to self-destruct. So we want to um, engage people and educate people about their relationship with technology and our relationship as humanity with technology with the idea that if we understand it uh, okay. and if we introspect hard and think about what we want from it, that we will be more likely to uh, have a positive future with technology. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Luckin, please tell us a little bit more about your work uh, at the University um, College of London. Thanks very much, Jenny. Like my co-panelists, uh, we all wear multiple hats as we were talking about earlier. But the thing that connects all of mine is this investigation of the relationship between human and artificial intelligence with particular respect to education and training. Mm -hmm. So looking at that interface, where do the human and the intelligence, the human and the artificial intelligence meet, interact? How do we specify that interface? Because that helps us to look to see what are the skills, expertise, knowledge, understanding that humans need in order to really leverage the power of AI to their benefit, Got to it. increase their learning, to make them smarter, if you uh -huh. like. So it's kind of <laughs> similar to, to, to the work, but with particular respect to education and training and all about how we leverage the artificial to keep the human way smarter. Got it, great. Um, actually, a noted organizer, I'm having, a, can I get a headset? Because it's a little bit harder to hear as there's more ambient noise in. Great. Um, but to kick off with, um, l I want to just unpack this term, the skills gap, because it's a term that I'm, I'm seeing increasingly um, you know, referenced in concerns about jobs, about the future of work. 
But I'd like to, you know, maybe from your different global, uh, get a global perspective of what we mean by the skills gap. And maybe I'll just start, start off with from where I sit in the Silicon Valley in San Francisco. So many people talk about the skills gap in terms of hard skills, like technology, like coding. Um, you know, Google can't hire enough engineers to say, you know, for, for its company. But I assume that's, you know, it's a very small part of the world. So uh, maybe, uh, Hanari, let's start off with you. When you, uh, from your work here, uh, and also maybe across the world in uh, Arab regions, when we talk about the skills gap, what comes to mind for you first? What comes to mind is that this is an, evol an evolving term. We cannot specify a gap and say that this is the gap and now we can fill it and we can reskill. This is an ongoing thing. As the job market of tomorrow, the job market of the 21st century is changing all the time, the required skills for our youth are changing. So we can specify some skills that you know, are completely missing within the educational system, and I would specify one, financial literacy. But as well, other success, uh, success uh, factors are missing as well. Um, so this skill gap is the, it's a, it's a term that I don't think will go away anytime soon mm -hmm. because first of all, the acceleration of the requirements of the job market, the change of the job market is happening at an alarming stage. So whenever the, educate, the educational system feels that we are catching up, they're firefighting. They're actually not catching up because the jobs, the requirements are changing and we're just moving ahead. So there will always be a gap. Mm -hmm. The question is, will we have dynamic systems that can catch up and can reflect these gaps into our educational systems. And, you know, one of the questions that you asked, mm -hmm. is the educational system a solely owned um, entity that is own, the only person that is in charge of adequately preparing the youth for the future or tomorrow, of tomorrow, or is it a multi-stakeholder uh, effect? Mm -hmm. When you talk about financial literacy, that's not a question, and it's not an answer I, I often hear too much. So more specifically, I mean, what are some of the specific um, financial literacy, sk literacy skills that you're finding that students or adults uh, need to like, brush up on? Like, Everything. What problems do they Everything. have? Everything. I think as we are advancing our uh, financial sector, a lot of uh, products that are coming up that are completely new to the average individual. So let's start up by someone who's graduating as an engineer and gets given a credit card without any knowledge of what kind of um, uh, you know interest rate they're paying, what is the requirements for their uh, paying schedule, and let's look at any kind of financial system that uh, give so much financing to individuals without looking at how they will pay back. We're consumer uh, societies, you know, all over the world. We are becoming consumer human individuals and consumer societies. So we're coming up with all of these advances in the finance system just to make sure that we're giving you what you need. And I'm a banker. As we all spoke, you know, we, we wear mul multiple hats. So we're coming up with all of these inventions without actually explaining them to the average individual. So financial literacy is as well an ever-evolving thing. It's not only savings and, you know, con what are you consuming, but what are the products that are available in the market? How can you get them to help you in your life rather than them becoming something that is a burden on you on the long term? Got it. Uh, may I want to pose this question to you? When you when, when you first see the word skills gap, what ideas, thoughts, questions come come into your mind? Yeah. So traditionally, the the Future of Life Institute has always uh, taken a long term perspective. So not thinking just about the next five years, the next ten years, but really thinking about the development of technology from AI maybe to AGI, artificial general intelligence, maybe something human level like. So when I think of the the skills gap, I, you know, I also think a little bit of humanity's identity crisis, <laughs> sort of. I think we're we're really, you know, face we're at the unique point in point of time in history where we are really uh, struggling to define what it means to, to be human and what we value about being human. Um, and I think as machines are getting better and better at uh, you know, some of our cognitive skills, which we, we took great pride in right, for, for decades, if not hundreds of years, 
um, I think we have to rethink a little bit about what, what does it mean to be human? What do we value about it? Uh, what, what does it mean to work, really? Because it might look completely different, and it certainly is already looking very different than it, than it looked uh, decades ago. Mm -hmm. But I think that we also have um, this responsibility to uh, think thoroughly and not just um, sort of put technology first and try to redefine ourselves around it, but put ourselves first and, and think what it is that we want. What do we want to do with, with this technology? And, you know, what do we want for, uh, for it to mean to be, to be human and for us to be working? And what skills do we want to um, continue to, uh, you know, to, to gain and to uh, value. Can society. I push you for one specific skill? I mean, Hanari's talked about financial literacy a little bit. Um, what would be the most pressing kind of skill or example of a skills gap that you would come up with as you yeah, think about so what it means to be human? So, you know, to, to go back to my psychology hat. So, for example, in psychology, for the longest time, psychology has been so incredibly focused on uh, pathology and everything that means disorder and everything that means abnormal development. And I think with, with technology, we have this fantastic opportunity to think about flourishing and well-being and what does it mean to really be happy. And we see a, a surge in uh, research on positive psychology, for example. So one of the skills that I would love for people to have is, you know, how do you have, how, how, how do you how are you happy? How do you become happy? How do you how do you know how to use technology to, um, you know, make your lives better and and happier? So a little bit of, I guess, self awareness, introspection, and mindfulness in in our relationship with technology. I think we should teach more of it, learn more of it, develop more of it. I'm not going to disagree with happiness as a as a goal. Uh, how about you, Rose? Um, I know a good panel always has a bit of disagreement, but. I'm not going to disagree with what's been said prior to this on this particular issue. But what I would perhaps disagree with is the focus on skills. It might be because I'm UK based that I feel particularly strongly about the problems of the word skills. Um, we've definitely fallen into a trap in the UK of talking about skills or knowledge. And therefore, conversations about skills tend to get sidetracked by people going, oh, but it's about knowledge, not skills. And I always want to say, yeah, but you need skillful knowledge and knowledgeable skills. They're not two different things. And so I tend to prefer to talk in terms of intelligence okay. and think about, very much in line with what you were saying, the way we need to redefine human intelligence because we have this amazing AI technology. So I like to think in terms of developing human intelligence, the rich repertoire of human intelligence, particularly the elements of that repertoire that we can't yet, okay. possibly ever, depending on your perspective, build using AI technologies. So examples would be, and interestingly, looking at your, your poll on, on the screen there, it's interesting to see real world problem solving and teamwork, very leadership, you know. So, <laughs> When I think in terms of intelligences, I think very much, yeah, we need interdisciplinary academic knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. You really need that for real world problem solving. You need social intelligence. You really need that for teamwork and leadership. You need a different relationship to knowledge, not one that's about accepting knowledge, believing knowledge is something that you're given. It's one that believes that you construct knowledge and understanding for yourself. It's a, it's a relationship that understands that knowledge is relative. And actually, you have to make your own decisions about whether you believe something to be true or not based on evidence. Therefore, you need to understand what sound evidence is. The old-fashioned terms of epistemology, but people don't like that word very much now. So I think of it as meta-knowing. And then I think the other elements that we need to stress are the things that actually relate to mindfulness. It is our understanding of ourselves, because that's what differentiates us enormously from our AI peers. It is that capability for self-understanding. So it is metacognitive. It is meta-emotional, meta-subjective intelligence. It is meta-contextual in intelligence, understanding our physical place in the world and the way that we can interact in different contexts, actually seamlessly. I've never been in this space before. 
But right. actually, it's fine. I kind of know how it's meant to work. Mm -hmm. And that's part of that self-understanding of me in space, in context, interacting mm -hmm. with other people. And I think if we take that perspective around thinking about human intelligence and how we need to develop it in all its richness across the repertoire, particularly the elements of what I would call meta-intelligence, then I think we can really, yes, tap into the skills, if you want to use the word skills, or knowledge, or skillful knowledge, or knowledgeable skills, and you kind of get away from that slightly divisive debate. Okay. As you talk about, um, you know, how artificial intelligence forces us to kind of rethink human intelligence. What are some of the common assumptions about how we define intelli human intelligence today that y you hope that we want to challenge, that need to be challenged? Oh, can I just start with IQ tests? <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's move beyond that. You know, there's th th we have not really thought about intelligence as humans in terms of education and training and changing our perspective on intelligence for decades. You know, often I still meet people who talk about IQ tests as being wow. the differentiating factor of intelligence in humans. And I go, whoa, hang on a minute, surely we've moved on from that. But actually, I think we really do need to look at our own intelligence. And, and there's a lot of work in psychology, I know, that does. But in the education and training space, we haven't really done that re-exploration that needs to be done. Uh, actually, I don't know if, uh, if people are um, aware of how IQ tests came to be. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a funny story because they were, they were tests that were commissioned by the U.S. government to decide which grade to uh, put immigrant children in, immigrant children who were coming into the country who didn't speak the language, who were, it was very hard to evaluate their skills and their school readiness. So IQ tests were basically a school readiness test. Uh, so, and if you even think about the word readiness, what does that mean? It, it always defined uh, with respect to a system that you have that has changed tremendously since then. Um, so I think that, you know, instead of, you know, squeezing the child into or, or, or the individual into just this, uh, this shape that has been created, why not, you know, change the system so that it does serve the, the individual best. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with the IQ test. Can I throw the pendulum a bit far off? I would challenge the brick and mortar classroom as where someone receives their education. Because we've understood that education now, first of all, um, in my part of the world, education is a sacred cow. It is um, uh, purely represented by ministries of education that, you know, uh, describe a curriculum that you have to, uh, this is how it should, and your actual objective is to get this degree. Now, this has changed. This has completely changed. As, as an employer, I don't look for these educational certificates as much as I look at uh, uh, first uh, uh, emotional intelligence, critical thinking, aspects that take knowledge but use it in a certain way to help me in my own business. And I think these are the requirements. These requirements do not only come from a brick and mortar classroom. It's lifelong uh, uh, learning, it's um, interaction with people. I'm not one with, um, as well, a complete ed tech, you know, outside the human interaction aspects. I believe we can learn from each other much more than we can learn. We can have knowledge, but as well, human interaction, teamwork comes from human interaction. Critical thinking comes from just speaking to one another and understanding the way we think. So I, I would challenge the brick and mortar. It's not a place. Education today is not a place. It's a process that goes through the whole lifelong experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, kind of going off onto that, um, what examples have you seen of maybe your own work or maybe other, other countries, other systems that have really kind of pushed this idea or challenged this idea and have successfully been able to get people to shift from thinking about education as just a classroom, as a brick and mortar institution? Shifting is a dynamic thing. We are still shifting. And I must say, um, I'm not very pessimistic about technology and AI as some, as some might think. I think as in any, any kind of 
a new experience, the first industrial revolution, we're on the fourth one now. The pendulum usually shifts so far off into technology, but then comes back into normality. And there are people who are scared out of this technology that just stay behind. So my, um, going back to your question, what have I seen? Um, education system are very slow to react. Mm -hmm. We read reports today about you know, jobs that are not required for the new uh, um, 21st century workforce. Yet we still churn graduates out of our universities with specific disciplines that, you know, an accountant. What does an accountant do that my SAP system cannot do? I need an engineer with accountancy. I need someone who's a biophysicist with accountancy. I need these multi-disciplines. So these things, education systems usually take some time to pick up on and change. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things that we are pushing for. So it's a multi-discipline approach. It's something that needs, first of all, at the heart of it, adaptability of the person. And I think this comes, um, um, you know, adaptability is a, is a trait that we, uh, we learn as young as, you know, toddlers at the home. And it's something that grows up with you. So you're, you're taught adaptability in the classroom. You're taught adaptability at work. You're taught adaptability while speaking to Tony. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you adapt to the, the, the place you are in. So these are the things that we are working on. Now, um, Rose, did you want to I was add just something? Gonna, I mean, I think you're right about the brick and mortar model of education and the problem around certification. I mean, they're, the things that drive education are very much the credentialing of a particular set of knowledge, skills, abilities, capabilities. And that's something that I think is being challenged, as you describe. But at the moment, it's still quite strong and it still holds to account a lot of educators because they can't move away from it as individuals. And I think the other thing that one needs to recognize in the, for younger age groups, of course, is the fact that education is, is about more than the knowledge and skills, you know, is a way of looking after children. So there is a kind of physical presence about that. And I'm not saying that can't be challenged. I'm just saying that is one of the things that also drives the current model of education. So I think you're right. It needs to change. But I think also the expectations of society and of policymakers needs to change with respect to education. We need to rethink what the real reason for our education and training systems is because as the world is changing as we've all reflected we do need to evolve the system and it's really stuck at the moment and and there are things happening around the edge but it's actually how do we really make that fundamental shift particularly around credentialing that would free up the system to evolve more in line with the way the world of work and, and our lives outside of education are evolving. Can you point to some, I mean, are there any examples of uh, either, I don't know, companies or institutions that are doing this well? So back to the question. So we're not going to do IQ tests. Uh, we're, let, let's say we get rid of IQ tests, we get rid of the traditional credentialing system. Uh, I assume that nobody here is going to argue for standardized tests as another pr good proxy. But what is, um, what are systems or processes in place that are a good, um, you know, kind of a good proxy for kind of the intelligence, you know, the, the, the new kinds of intelligences that, that you all talk to. I'm happy to answer, but I don't want to hog the, the microphone. I'll, give, I'll try and be quick. There are lots and lots of organizations who are trying to break the mold, admirably, in a situation where we still have a world that's really still driven largely by credentials. There's, there's a lot of them out there. And I think some of them are also really challenging the actual credential itself. So if you think about the No Transcript organization that's emanated in the US, but is working with some of the top universities to try and move away from the way students are admitted to university to adopt a totally different way of evidencing a student's suitability for university, then I think we can see, you know, there is movement, but it's really small. I have the pleasure of sitting on a panel for our Office for Students in the UK, which is the regulator for higher education. 
And we've spent quite a lot of time trying to look at alternative models of provision in higher education to see where they might change the way we need to think about what we provide through mm -hmm. universities and colleges. And I'm not trying to be all UK centric. I'm just saying I think, you know, it is an interesting space we're in at the moment. There are pop there are alternatives popping up all over the place. But until as societies we make a clear decision that we are going to move away from the particular credentials that have driven society to date, then what are parents meant to do? You know, for most parents, what do you want for your child? Do you want them to be happy? You want them to, to have a job, you know, to, ha to, to enter the world of work effectively. At the moment, that's still rather driven by them having these tickets, if you like, to the next stage through these credentials. So it does need to be quite a major shift if we are going to make the innovation that needs to happen because we have to bring parents with us. You know, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent. I don't want my grandson as he is now and my granddaughter not being able to, to, to get a job or be successful because we didn't make sure they got the right tickets to the next stage. It's very difficult for parents at the moment. So it has to be a big shift in order for these bubbling up, innovative approaches to start gaining ground. Do you think that's a development for anybody here? That um, I want to switch the conversation more to back to technology a little bit. Um, have advances in education technology help to push this, like push the shift, or help, uh, as Fernando you said, you know, provide opportunities for education outside of the schooling system? Absolutely. In in my part of the world, we look at how do we reach the masses. And I think technology gave us a tool to reach the masses, to reach the masses within education. You know, uh, mocks are something that are uh, excellent to, to be provided. It's a technological uh, uh, opportunity that we can reach the masses that in other ways we cannot reach. So it has achieved uh, a goal in that. But as we're coming into this, um, uh, you know, sometimes unknown uh, future that we're looking into. There isn't one model that fits all. There are different models uh, that are emerging. Some are successful, some are not this, uh, that successful. But technology plays a very big part in everything that we're seeing, especially with education. Because how can we ignore a life, a lifelong that you know we'll, we'll be going into when we are young? Um, and I go back to the example of a parent. I met a parent the other day who told me that you know he's keeping his kids away from uh, any kind of iPhone, iPad until they're 14. And I said, what? How are they going then to reflect? You know, to be uh, um, uh, shocked with with this technology when they are 14? Now it's a matter of life. You know, you give an iPad to a two-year-old, he starts turning the pages. So technology is in our life, and it's there to stay. It's a matter of which kind of technology will serve us in terms of education, in terms of progressive, and in terms of bettering the lifestyle of the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, domain in which technology has made a huge difference for a lot of people is uh, for children with learning disabilities. So I spent a, a, a part of my career actually um, devoted to studying uh, learning disabilities and uh, working for small nonprofits that were engaged with developing the type of technology that would help people. Um, so for example, children with dyslexia, we take it for granted that you need to absolutely need to know how to read and how to write. But the truth is, these days, there are audiobooks, there are other ways to access the same information. Uh, the other thing that we see in the world is, you know, huge migrations, right? Language has been such a huge barrier and uh, I've worked a little bit also being an international student myself for a good part of my life and, and struggling with, you know, learning a second language and trying to think and speak and write in a se second language. Technology has, has made huge improvements and has brought a lot of benefit to, to people who are struggling in one way or another with accessing information and mm -hmm. engaging with it and making it much more easy. So that's another way to, to think about the, the beneficial impact of technology in education. Got it. 
Um, as a technology reporter, every time we talk about the benefits of technology, I always have to swing to the other side and you know look at well, what are the limitations to which technology can help push the needle, or are there ways in which technology can actually reinforce some of the issues that exist within our education system? And maybe I'll have to pose that to you, Rose, to kind of provide the more kind of nuanced. Actually, I don't think we've done enough for special needs. I, you know, there's so much that can be done, as you've started to describe. And, and actually, I think technology has tended to date to benefit the better off, the more privileged, who can leverage it to, to their effect. So you're so right. I think in terms of limitations, we need to recognize that we're at a current stage in the evolution of our relationship to technology. We tend to still talk in terms of devices, in terms of pieces of technology. I think we need to recognize that actually what the future is more likely to bring if we get it right is this intelligence infrastructure where you get the data analyzed by really smart algorithms, hopefully in the case of education and training algorithms that are informed by people who understand human learning, psychologists, social scientists, educators, or learning sciences, as I would put it. Because if we get that right, it's very powerful because we can start to track the learning process, which starts to solve your credentialing problem straight away, but also starts to shift the power to the individual learner. Because if we can show individual learners their pro learning processes, how they're developing, not just in terms of whether they're doing well at math, physics, history, but also whether they're developing the resilience, the confidence, the motivation, the emotional intelligence, the social intelligence as well, then we empower them. And we also empower their educators to be able to be far more nuanced and specific and, and, and targeted in the support that they provide. And if we get that right, and of course that intelligence infrastructure is the meeting point of the human and the artificial, because it's not just the tech, then that starts to power all of the devices. And that then drives the interactions that we have. So we start to lose the limitations on the individual pieces of technology, because we're actually building an infrastructure that powers all of the interactions, in my head, in education and training. And that includes this, conversations like this. It includes me learning on my own, but it includes me using my phone or my laptop or a robot or whatever. But we've moved beyond seeing the technology as just the individual devices. Mm -hmm. And that gets us away from some of the problems with technology around screen time, which is probably what's driving the parent that you were describing to say, I don't want my child to be using the technology, because they're worried about the specifics of that artifact. Whereas when we move to think in terms much more of the infrastructure, then the limitations of the artifact become secondary if we get it right. Does that make sense? And does it help to so answer I your question? So I do want to push back. You've, meant, you, you, you've mentioned this <laughs> conditional phrase multiple times, if we get this right. Yes. So I want, I want to dive into that a little bit. So if we get this right, what, is, what, what does that really mean? Like what are the fact, how do we get this right? How do we get it wrong? Woo, okay. <laughs> I feel one of the big problems at the moment is that we're being too driven by the technology and the capabilities of the technology. I was privileged last year to work on something in the UK called the Topol Review, which was a review of our National Health Service, which is the second largest employer in the world, I think. And it was a review that was looking at the impact of innovation, specifically digital technologies, genomics and artificial intelligence and robotics on the health service. And at the start of the year, it was driven by an American clinician, Eric Topol. And at the start of the year, the technologists were driving the conversation. It was, we are going to be able to build technology that will do X, Y, and Z. Therefore, the workforce needs A, B, and C. And by the end of the year, the conversation was much more, ah, okay, the technology might be able to do that, but that doesn't mean that's the way that we're going to end up needing to use it. It's not necessarily the way that people will accept its usage. It's not necessarily the way that when it's contextualized, it will actually work. So we moved towards a realization that it was much more about building a learning culture in a workforce that was resilient, that was accepting, that it would constantly need to change its relationship to technology, would always be needing to learn as something new came along, and as that 
something embedded into the system. Of course, the specific training you need to provide for advanced technology that's designed to, you know, uh, you know, very advanced technologies around particular illnesses or particular skills. But in general, it's much more about the human. And what worries me is that in many instances, that's not what's driving the decisions. It's driven by the technology. All over the place, I see, for example, a very specific example, pieces of AI being brought into a business and then falling over because they weren't the right thing to be brought into that business because people hadn't understood the business and the humans that operate in that business and the data in that business and the nature of that business enough to know what the right thing was to do with the AI. Mm -hmm. So the wrong things brought in, but we're driven by this, oh, we've got to have some AI, you know, oh, we're falling behind our competitors if right. we haven't got this AI bot doing this, that and the other. And it's a real problem. Sorry. It sounds like, no, I think I, I also get the sense that sometimes when I read about all the excitement and hype over AI and big data, that it's all, it can sometimes seem like there's like an arms race to build the biggest and best, you know, the biggest and baddest AI, collecting the most data as much as possible. Um, and maybe, I don't know if, maybe if this is something you can speak to in, in your research on your kind of human and AI in, interactions. Um, I guess, you know, as we think about preparing, um, you know, the future generation of work, um, people, of, of humans to work with technology, to even, or maybe build some of these technologies that involve AI or anything else, um, wh how do we ensure that, um, you know, they, they, they do it with um, perhaps the most, uh, while, while keeping in line with human values and, and, and ethics? Because... I tend to be, I mean, I don't know if you agree with the statement, but technology is not agnostic. The people who build technology Im, you know, imbue some of their morals and values into it. So what is, um, you know, what is, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, so I, I think one place to start is to think very thoroughly about what are our resources and how technology is using them. So, for example, attention is a resource that we have that technology keeps hacking into. We keep being hacked and we are very easily hacked. Um, even ourselves as social beings, right? We, we talk a lot about our social skills as being something that, you know, technology doesn't yet have, AI agents don't yet have. But they are so easily hackable. I, I work with humanoid robots. You put googly eyes on them. Oh, wow. Everybody is like, oh, so cute. Sure, I'll give you my, my credit card number. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, you know, really coming to grips with who we are, how hackable we are, that's the first step um, in, in trying to make technology, you know, really work for us. And then also, you know, echoing a little bit what Rose was saying, just because we can do it doesn't mean that we should do it. And I think people have had a very, very hard time with that. Humanity has had a very hard time with saying no mm -hmm. to things that, that we were able to do. What's an example? Um, what, what should, what should, where, where should we draw the line? I mean, an example of something that people, you know, initially wanted to build AI automator, build AI for, and then we recognize actually, you know, th that's not a good idea. Well, one of the things that I think we should absolutely not do is build lethal autonomous weapons, for example, just to echo a little bit what my, what, uh, my husband was talking about this, this morning. So that is, that is a clear case. You know, we have this fantastic potential to use technology to save lives. Why do we want to build something that will take lives? Um, so that's, that's, for example, one of, the, one of the struggles and one of the things that we're facing right now. And mm -hmm. it, is, it is up to us. Is there to an example specific to education? Of course, you know, we don't want to kill people, but maybe in the purpose of more of education, have we, are there lines that you believe need to be drawn? Yeah, so for example, a lot of AI right now, I mean, there, there's a lot of development in AI that monitors our attention, right? And, mm. and really, really big brothers our, our attention. And I feel like that, that's, a, that's not necessarily the best use, use of it. I, as I said, attention is a fantastic resource that we have. And there's actually recent research in um, uh, comparing sort of Western industrialized countries uh, compared to, you know, more tribal style of living, you know, in Papua New Guinea. And one, one thing that really differentiates children, for example, in, in these parts of the world is how they 
how they manage their attention. In the West, your attention is constantly being managed. The whole point of education, I mean, a big part of education in the West is about relinquishing your right to your attention and letting the teacher, you know, direct you to things, letting your computer direct you to things, letting your AI tell you what to believe, what opinion to have, what news article to, to read, who to vote for even. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes it, being aware that we're going too far is, is very important and, and drawing a line at how much do we want to relinquish our control over our attention. That's just one example, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to think about limitations of, of AI. Maybe we shouldn't use it all the time. Maybe we shouldn't yeah. build something that does that. Um, I look at it from another point. As we are building our AI capabilities, I think, first of all, we have to understand that there are limitations. So when it comes to AI coming into, you know, skipping to into uh, moral decisions, there has to be another system that is built on the other side, which is the value system. And I think sometimes uh, in this interaction that's becoming one to one uh, with the, uh, w uh, you know, between the individual and technology, we are missing this value, uh, value preservation system that we have to have. So we have to build a value system. And that starts from a very young age, but is continuously evolving as we grow up. So it stays with you within your, uh, within your schooling years, within your uh, university years. It turns into, um, 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 you know, the company's uh, uh, compliance system. But as well, it has to have some policymaker aspects mm -hmm. that draw some lines in policymaking on where does technology stop, where doesn't it infringe on the morality aspects and morality decisions mm -hmm. that we are taking as uh, human beings. And I think that's a very important thing. Do you think there's a need to more explicitly or more directly teach these values or tell teachers to teach these values in their Absolutely. kids? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that as we are, you know, when I grew up, our uh, Ministry of Education was called Ministry of Education and Upbringing. Tarbiya wa ta'aleem, because this is what you are expecting from a place that you place your child for half of the day. So the value system starts at home, but it has to be encouraged within your schooling system. And this is what we're doing in JA Worldwide. So we have year-long um, value and ethics programs that run in tandem with your curriculum that emphasize that, you know, um, like in, in business schools, we take uh, uh, case studies and we take decisions based on case studies. Here we have problems, real life problems, and you have to come up with an ethical solution for them. And this is how you, you uh, uh, prepare uh, the youth for coming into this aspect of a free world with free access to knowledge, free access to everything. And again, coming back to your question, technology is reliant on uh, the value system and what the objectives of the user is. So we cannot stop someone from turning a very useful tool like Google into a big spy over our life unless there are ethical and value systems as well as policy that stops this. And this is what the discussion is now. And I'm, I, I'm happy that this is a conscious thing that's happening all over the world. So it's, it's, it's a discussion between multi-stakeholders, the private sector, the governments, educators, and as well as uh, uh, parents themselves. Definitely have a comment on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that the OECD Framework 2030 project has ethics in it as something that needs to be taught that needs to be part of the curriculum. So I think that's interesting. Never thought of the intention example in the way you expressed it. Such a neat example. But my fear, and it's a fear that drove me, one of my other hats is I'm co-founder of the Institute for Ethical AI in Education. And the reason that I co-founded it with Sir Anthony Selden and Priya Lakhani was because we were so worried that education fundamental as it is to life, was not top of the agenda in conversations around data and ethics and AI and ethics. You know, take, you said what could go wrong. I can see so easily why decision makers whose attention is on the bottom line could be tempted to have 
system X that will provide individualized education to everyone in a school, in a college, whatever. And system X is AI driven, doesn't take any days off sick, doesn't need any holiday, can work 24 seven, gets improves all the time as it learns, as it individualizes towards the children. Ah, okay, so maybe we don't need these human teachers anymore. Maybe we can just have System X and some minders for the young children, bouncers for the older ones if they get a bit leery. And I suddenly realized that this dystopian vision was actually far more possible than I like to think. Right. You know, because in theory, you could build a system like that. Obviously, it wouldn't provide a good quality education, but actually, it could tutor students in the core areas of the curriculum that we value far too much at the moment. So I think there is a real, real risk. Obviously, the ethical agenda is much broader. And I think, you know, I look at courses in my own university and in other universities I've worked with. And the people building the systems, ethics is generally an add-on course. Sometimes it's even option not a compulsory course. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody needs to understand ethics, particularly if you're involved in building technology. But actually, we all need to understand ethics. And we all need to understand the ethical implications of even using AI, because it is part of our lives. We're not, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. And it does change the conversation, because it does put into stark contrast things around. You know, emotion recognition can be used for good, can be used for bad. Where's the red line? Where's the red line on what data should be collected? There is no such thing as raw data. It doesn't exist. Somebody somewhere made a decision to collect that data, and that is an ethically driven decision, or not an ethically driven, but it's a values-based decision. It needs to be an ethical decision. It's a huge area, and it's certainly something within our education systems that we have to include. Are you seeing more and more emergence of courses specific about ethics and AI? And not enough. Science? Not, not enough. enough. And, and not enough recognition that this is something that needs to be tackled with younger ages as well. You know, th th and this relates to AI, and I think we could do it as a, a sort of a, a combined effort in helping people to understand AI more. And I don't mean coding. Everybody gets off on a conversation about coding. I love coding, but it's not the answer to this. You know, the key decision in a machine learning algorithm is the imperative of that algorithm. It's not the code you write it in. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to decide what your machine learning algorithm is going to do, what data it's going to process, for what reason, to what effect, for what use, mm -hmm. before you even get to the code. The coding's the easy bit at the end. We need people to understand the fundamentals of what AI is, what it can do, what it can't do. Then they start to understand the ethical implications as well. But we don't think of this enough there are not enough courses particularly for educators and particularly for younger age ranges we need way more and as we explore the role of ai in education um how do you reconcile or kind of think about the fact that different countries different regions may attach different values value systems to education or maybe to privacy or to data right which is a big part of how these ai uh, tools and systems operate um, how do you think about reconciling? Do these things need to be reconciled? Are there fundamental value, you know, you know, values that can't be broached, or are there? Will we have to live with different kind of expectations for, you know, the role of AI in education, depending on what region or culture you're in? I, I tend to to think a lot of about ethics uh, from the point of view of, of social psychology. I, I feel that. Ethics is really just a tool for making people cooperate well. And I okay. think that, you know, um, figuring out ways in which we cooperate with each other, which we have to as we live in a more globalized society, I think that implicitly will give us some um, solutions, some ethical solutions to some of, some of these problems of, you know, siloed values. I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest problems with technology in education and training to date is the fact that people believe they can scale a particular technology. And they miss the fact that actually the thing that makes education effective is its contextualization for the individual, for the educator, for the group. 
And that means that there is no scalable technology that will address education for everyone. Does not exist, will not exist. I think we might be in the same territory with ethics. I think we might need to treat the way that we evolve our ethical systems, guidelines, principles in a way that recognizes the need for localization so that we have a set of very transparent principles and guidelines and the way that those are or are not adopted needs to be made clear and the way that different cultures, different localities relate to those is clear and then people know what they're dealing with because there's no doubt that technology AI is a global entity mm -hmm. but that different parts of the world do have different values, do have different cultures, do have different relationships to what they would consider to be ethical and what we might not. And I think we also have to respect that. But it needs to be clear so that people can make an informed decision. One of the biggest problems, and, and Myra and I will be used to this with ethical panels in universities always having to get ethical consent for every piece of research you want to do, is that actually there's not enough of that at the moment. You know, there's not enough about informed consent. I know that the immense efforts we have to go to with any human subject that, that takes part in any piece of research we do to make sure that they are truly giving their informed consent. Great. <laughs> Right. Um, we're going to open it up uh, for, um, for some questions right now, and I believe that there, is, there, there should be some mic runners. So if you raise your hand, I believe um, they will be able to reach you. Is there, there are some mic runners? They might need a headset. Oh, you might need a headset. Okay. <laughs> All right, do we have a first question or who's there? Oh, can, oh, oh, can you, um, when you ask your question, please keep it a question and can you please announce, uh, just share who you are. Okay, hello. My name is Masa Mufti. I'm an educator from Syria and I have a nonprofit that provides education support for refugees in Lebanon. And I also learn, uh, I work as the head of the Arabic curriculum at Learning Equality specifically focusing on providing access to blended learning to vulnerable communities. So your panel is extremely relevant to my area of work. And I wanted to address, I mean, to keep it focused on the subject that you were discussing and debating, which is um, our education system are failing to provide social justice in terms of education and providing equal opportunities. So I, th I think this was not highlighted enough, but I, it was implicit in what you were saying. So wouldn't you think that um, education system, if they, not, if they do not transform themselves eventually with the, with the drive and with the advancement of technology, they would become by themselves obsolete. And that actually the way to free up our system from credentials is by focusing more on blended learning, online learning, and probably even offline learning to provide more access to all these increasingly growing, increasingly vulnerable communities in the world. So one thing is like, how can we actually make education system more responsive or more alarmed and more on our side to become more, uh, uh, you know, empathetic towards uh, these systems and technology driven learning? Because they are typically very reluctant and very resistant. That's one question. The other question is, I also fear, I'm very much for, you know, freeing up credentials and making the world more free and more creative. But I'm also very much aware and alarmed as well by the lack of standards and quality assurance. So how do we make a balance between these two elements? Thank you. If I may. I'll take it one step further. I think the region we live in, um, we do have obsolete education systems. We're not in the verge of becoming obsolete. They are obsolete. And we have to recognize that. Um, I think um, there is a problem in the mindset of our societies that uh, sees education as a degree um, and gives 
you know, less esteem to any kind of knowledge that is um, uh, ed tech or that comes from other sources. And this is a mindset shift. So this has to happen. But as well, I see that we have a massive opportunity in our region. We have to leapfrog. It's exactly what happened with China with the currency-less aspect. Because they didn't have the credit cards, they became a, um, you know, um, uh, um, internet payment uh, society, WeChat, uh, WeChat and everything, mm -hmm. society very quickly. Because we do not have the, the systems there, we can leapfrog. But it all depends on the understanding of the policymakers. And what's important for policymakers, it's the efficiency of the economy. Does their economy work well? And we're telling them, look, you're going into a brick wall. You know, if you don't have an, a, a, a skilled labor force, then the future is nowhere to be seen. You're not competitive, let alone, you know, um, it was, there was a, some time then when um, everyone had these uh, glamorous words and knowledge-based uh, economy, I don't know what. They, and then they never followed up with the process of getting them there. In Qatar, we were very fortunate. We started off with our education system. We started off with uh, understanding that you had to have a blended aspect from knowledge, skills, and values that can have uh, uh, com competencies that are very relevant to the workforce. But for the rest of the region, we are in a very big problem. And we are facing 100 million youth that in the same, if they go into the same system, we will have a hundred million unemployed as well that need to be reskilled for the future. Um, does anyone want to take that the, the second question about credentials? Where you know we don't like the existing credential system, but we still need some system for quality assurance. We do. What's better? We do, and I think um, NASA. <laughs> one of the ways that we might be able to deal with this, and we need to be smart because you're so right. Policymakers drive a lot of the decisions. We can, we know, if we get it right, sorry that phrase again, um, <laughs> use AI systems to collect data. If we analyze it carefully, we can really get evidence. What are credentials about? They're about providing evidence that somebody can do something. We can build systems that can build that lifelong evidence trail. Lots of ethical issues about who would own that, but we certainly can do it. But I think we will always come up against the traditional view that we have done this credentialing in this way, in this standardized ways, for good reasons, for decades. Therefore, we should continue with the known quality assured standard. But I think we can possibly bridge that gap by being able to demonstrate that by using these AI-enabled continuous, if you like, assessment systems, we can provide precisely the same level of quality as those standardized tests. And the way we might do that is by identifying what I might call micro-credentials. So little bits that you can pick up from your data stream about an individual that actually map across to the credentials that people like and understand and know. Now, it's not something that I think we actually need to do for the sake of the quality of someone's learning. It's much more important, in my view, to help them understand their own data and for, for educators to understand that, that particular student's data and indeed their whole pack of students' data. But if by doing that, it enables us to get over this obsession, I'm going to call it, with standardized tests, then we might actually be able to progress the conversation. So that would be my very pragmatic approach to this. Great. Uh, we've got a question from a gentleman up front. Yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful for this wonderful conversation. And uh, I need to say something here. Uh, I am the chair of uh, the Swedish uh, National Faculty, and I'm also uh, the chair of Stockholm Young Faculty here. One thing I'm really happy to see here that uh, we have three ladies in the panelists. Oh. I am really supporting the gender equality here, right? So this is uh, something great. I just want to say, in order to make sure that we have the right system, you guys didn't discuss the implementation. Implementation is something serious. How we implement to ensure the 
the first question she, the other lady that mentioned the, you know, the equality and how could we implement the ethics, mm -hmm. the rule. It's easy to say, but it, the implementation is the key factor most of the time. So mm -hmm. we need to enforce something sometimes. Thank right. you very much. May I just add one point? I, comment. I think our law, our laureate today uh, hit a, a nail on the head. So you actually educate the educators. There is a, a very, very important aspect of having the teachers understand what they're teaching and what they're providing. They're the conduit of this knowledge and skills and values. So implementation comes fr first from getting the right person to implement. And I think in a lot of areas of the world, the teacher has become a second grade citizen. We have examples of Finland, of, we have examples of places where the teacher is still taken into this high respect because he, you know, the teacher, she and he are a fundamental aspect Absolutely. of the whole thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got a question over there. Thank you for this. My name is Magdalena Rostron. I teach in Qatar Foundation in the Academic Bridge Program, which prepares students, local students, for entry into Western English language universities. And Sheikha Hanadi has just almost answered my question because my question as a teacher was this. How do you see the role of teachers in this uh, dynamic education environment with the changing parameters of the classroom, rethinking of the human intelligence along the lines of uh, multiple intelligences, the ever increasing need for ever increasing, ever new uh, skills, rethinking our concept of happiness and relationship with uh, technology. So what about teachers? Thank you. Teachers are the most important, of course, um, and we've got to consider them. I agree that their status has fallen in many countries to a lamentable level. I mean, it used to be the case that being an educator was something to be respected and valued, and I think we, we've lost that in some parts of the world. But I actually think the role of the teacher is the key to success here. If I look at a lot of the reports that are coming out at the moment, you know, all over the world, reports from big organizations like PwC, will a robot take my job or whatever, when they do their analyses, there's, there's not necessarily agreement across all of these different reports. But one thing that comes across very clearly is that the people who are most at risk are those with the poorest education, no surprises there. But also educators are in the lowest level of risk of being automated. But I think that analysis risks missing the point that educators' role is going to transform and change radically from what it is now. And I think we need to help educators have a much more proactive part in the conversation about how the technologies are designed for education. I think the way, for example, with AI, that we will develop the right kind of AI is if we get the AI developers working with the educators and researchers who understand how you drive the conversation through good evidenced learning success. We will not only help the AI developers, most of whom who do not have a clue about teaching and learning, to understand something more about education, will help the educators to understand so much more about AI. And if we get them working together in a co-designed way, we might really develop the kind of AI for education and training that educators can integrate into their practice effectively because they've been part of the conversation about what it is, what it does, why it's there. And I think that's the, I honestly believe that's the only way we will really leverage AI for the benefit of society with respect to education is through these co-design, co multi-stakeholder partnerships. Great, I think we have time for one or a maybe one more question. Is there anyone else around? No, we're good. Oh, all right. Is it time? <laughs> okay, sorry, I've been told that we're, we need to wrap up, Hi, but I think sorry. we're gonna...
One more question. We have one more question. Behind can, you. Can, can we have okay, a quick question? <laughs> yes. Okay, a um, quick question. Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm a learning solutions architect at the Hamad bin Khalifa University here in Qatar. Mm -hmm. And my question is around the adoption of policymakers and governments for, you know, the credentials. And how do we take that blending approach, blended approach, take online learning programs? How, how fast can we get that adoption on a higher government level mm -hmm. where people can actually want to take MOOCs, want to take blended learning programs because they know there's, you know, that credit is going to be seen as something. Maybe the quickest way to answer that is, are there examples of countries or governments that have, you know, been able to adopt that pretty uh, relatively quickly? India. Oh. Sorry, India has a very, India. very uh, successful model in that. And it's actually getting, y your main aspect in education is getting through to the masses and providing a better lifestyle for them. This is what education should be. And India has tried and tested and has a very successful model in that. Absolutely. I, I think that's it. And, and again, it actually speaks to what we talked about earlier. The reason it works so well in India is because it's just what India needs. And, it, and, and that's recognized and accepted in the same way that the example of money in China driving internet payments. It's that contextualization that's so important. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists um, for joining us for this wonderful conversation that touched on a lot of different things between skills and technologies and values and fundamentally what it means to be human. So thank you, Hanadi. Thank you, Maya. <coughs> thank you, Rose. Um, if you have other questions, I think we may stick around a little bit and hang out. So um, yeah, please enjoy it. Come talk to us.